You're looking at what used to be a beach in Greece. Extreme erosion from a rare Mediterranean cyclone. Summer of storms continuing on both sides of the Atlantic tonight. Breaking news, the new tropical threat. Two days after Hurricane Sally made landfall, now a new system is gaining strength, closing in on Texas. The Atlantic hurricane season now running out of names. The CDC reverses itself on testing yet again, walking back its latest guidance while caught in a firestorm between politics and science. Health officials once again say if you've been in close contact with someone infected with COVID-19, get a test, even if you aren't showing symptoms. And the president's claim about when the vaccine will be made available. Huge turnout for early voting today in four states. People waiting online for hours to cast their ballots in person as President Trump and Joe Biden both campaign in the Minnesota battleground. A firefighter killed battling the wildfires in the West. And could a couple now face charges after the announcement of their baby's sex sparked a wildfire? The clock is ticking for TikTok. So what's behind the Trump administration's banning of the wildly popular social media app? And why this Sunday's Emmy Awards are the most diverse yet? And why when it comes to representation, there's still work to do. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. 200,000. That's the grim and tragic milestone this country is expected to reach this weekend. A stunning 200,000 American lives lost to the coronavirus pandemic. And tomorrow marks six months since the state of California became the first state in the nation to announce stay at home orders. A cascade of states then followed suit this spring. It's been a series of fits and starts since then. Much of the country reopening, but then forced to scale back as COVID cases rose over the summer. And as we enter fall, the fears of another wave combined with the flu season is certainly a very real concern. Today, President Trump went to the White House podium and once again questioned the guidance of his medical and scientific experts, touting that a vaccine is on its way in a matter of weeks and that all Americans will have access by this spring. That is the CDC once again makes a major reversal on its guidance on who should get tested for the virus after reports of the earlier recommendations were written by political appointees and not by scientists. Our chief White House correspondent Jonathan Carl is tracking it all for us and starts us off. With Americans already lining up to vote and polls showing most disapprove of how he's handled coronavirus, President Trump is banking on a vaccine to boost his campaign. We essentially have it. We'll be announcing it fairly soon. Most experts say a vaccine won't be widely available until next year, but President Trump is giving the impression it's right around the corner. The administration will deliver it to the American people immediately. Distribution will begin within 24 hours. The president acknowledged most Americans won't be able to get the vaccine until April. Earlier this week, he lashed out when CDC director Dr. Robert Redfield told Congress it probably won't be widely available until months later. How is it that uh, you don't trust your own experts? Do you, do you, oh, do you think I you do. know better than they do? No, do I, think, I think I have. Yeah, I, in many cases I do. There are clear indications the White House has pressured the CDC to keep its statements about the virus in line with what the president says. Less than a month ago, the CDC put out guidance saying that even if you have been exposed to somebody with the virus, quote, you do not necessarily need a test if you don't have symptoms. Medical experts were puzzled. The New York Times reported the guidance was issued over the objection of the CDC's own scientists. And today, the CDC abruptly reversed itself, saying flatly, you need a test if you have been exposed to someone with COVID-19. It's what CDC experts had been saying for months. Right, they seem to be reverting back to that original guidance. Jonathan Carl joins us now. John, the president today also questioned the expertise of his own FBI director following his congressional testimony on threats facing the U.S. What did he have to say? Uh, well, he's got two major problems with what Christopher Wray, the FBI director, told Congress. On one hand, Christopher Wray told Congress uh, that Russia is working uh, very much to interfere with our election. It's a big threat, a big concern. And he also said that in terms of domestic terrorism uh, in this country, that the biggest threat comes uh, from racially motivated violence, especially from white supremacist groups. Uh, the president uh, sees the biggest threat in terms of foreign interference 
not being Russia, but being China, and the biggest domestic violence threat uh, being Antifa and, and left-wing groups. Uh, so he, he made it very clear he disagreed with Chris Ray on both of these points, uh, which led some reporters to ask whether or not he is considering replacing Chris Ray as the FBI director. Uh, he didn't give a direct answer, just saying we are looking into a lot of things. Mm. Lindsay? Okay. All right. Jonathan Carl reporting in from the White House. Thanks, John. And now to the new stage of the 2020 race as early voting kicks off in several states. And with all the concern about mail-in ballots, there was an hours-long wait to vote in person in Fairfax County, Virginia today, still more than six weeks before Election Day. Another early voting state kicking off today, the battleground of Minnesota, with Joe Biden and President Trump holding dueling campaign events there. ABC's Mary Bruce has the latest. Tonight, in the midst of this bitter campaign, with their lives upended by the pandemic, for thousands of Americans, it's finally time to vote. I am voting right here. I'm not moving until I In Virginia, one of four states where early voting started today, eager voters waiting up to four hours in this never-ending socially distanced line. Masks on. You bought snacks. <laughs> <laughs> Rafael Olivieri tells us this year he's taking no chances. Why come out today on the first day? You do have six more weeks to vote. Why now? This is 2020. Anything can happen. The sooner the better. With the president sowing doubt about mail-in voting and concerns over delays at the post office, Pava Cohen decided to show up in person. Did you consider at all voting by mail to, to avoid coming and standing in this line? Okay. No, not no, even for a second. Too many shenanigans. 32 states in Washington, D.C. have made changes to make it easier to vote in the pandemic. At least 12 states have already started sending mail-in ballots. In the key battleground of Minnesota, Steve O'Rourke today decided to vote early. Been either beating the crowds on, uh, on uh, November 3rd or uh, writing in. So I know my vote. It's not changing, so might as well do it today. Minneapolis officials say they're shattering records, mailing over 114,000 ballots. Mail, obviously, is what we are encouraging. Vote at home. Be safe. Joe Biden and President Trump both in Minnesota today, both trying to make their mark with working class voters. The former vice president has been trying to show he feels their pain. Right now I do work in a cancer center in the area. I make under $15 an hour. Oh. Today, Biden said Trump just doesn't get it. I don't look down my nose and people are busting their necks, just making a living. Trump says, by the way, I'm paraphrasing, everyone's in the stock market. That's why he cares about the stock market. What the hell is he talking about? And Mary Bruce joins us now. Mary, it's so interesting to see people already in line voting, a sign that many voters have already made up their minds. But it looks like the Biden and Trump campaigns are picking up their activity on reaching those uncommitted voters in key battleground states in particular. They are ramping up their campaigning and their travel to these key battleground states. Look, both of the candidates know, especially with this pandemic and with so much uncertainty as we head to Election Day, they want voters to get out there and vote one way or another as soon as possible, especially in 2020, a year where it seems anything can happen. They want to get these votes in the bank, and it's part of the reason why they are making the effort to get out there and travel to key battleground states. It's one of the reasons why we are seeing both of the candidates in Minnesota today. Lindsay? Of course. In battleground of Minnesota. Mary Bruce, thanks so much. And joining us now is the Minnesota Secretary of State, Steve Simon. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me. So the first day of early voting underway in your state today. Talk us through the safeguards in place to make sure that Minnesota residents can vote safely in the midst of this pandemic. Also, how the day went, any reports of problems? Well, one thing that's unique about the day today in Minnesota is not only is it the first day of voting in Minnesota and leading the country in that respect, but today also President Trump and Joe Biden are both in Minnesota on the same day campaigning. And I suspect that has contributed to the excitement and the sizzle around this event and probably accounts for the reports we're getting that at the physical locations on this first day of absentee balloting, there is more buzz and more activity than you'd normally expect. In terms of the overall uh, avenues for voters to vote, they are speaking loudly and clearly about what they want this year. And what many of them want, some for the first time, is to vote from home. We have seen an absolute shattering of the record for people requesting absentee ballots. As of today, we're at 926,000 people in this state. 
that have already requested to vote from home by absentee. Uh, that compares in the same period two years ago with something like 58,000 people that have requested it as of the same date two years ago. And so it's off the charts. People are speaking loudly and clearly. This is a way that really appeals to them this year. And, and how is it going so far without a glitch? So far, really without a glitch, I have to say. Um, there are always gonna, there's always going to be something. But so far, the in-person component, we haven't heard any complaints. Everyone has their ballots on time. And in terms of the absentee ballot process, those ballots, for those who have already ordered them, will go out in the mail today. So they should be arriving in mailboxes all over Minnesota in the coming days. And people can start sending them back or hand delivering them back whenever they choose. And you were on a call yesterday with dozens of secretaries of state and with the postmaster general. There's reporting that it got heated at times. Did you raise any Minnesota specific issues? And are you confident that the Postal Service can handle uh, a dramatic increase in mail in ballots in Minnesota and across the country? Yeah, I would call it pointed but cordial, as somebody else said, and I agree with that. Uh, I would say this. I have confidence that they have the logistical capabilities. They have the trucks, they have the vehicles, they have the people. And in Minnesota, we've had a really good relationship with the folks on the ground here and the folks running the show here. Washington's another story. Uh, timeliness is always an issue. But even with the delays that we're reading and seeing uh, uh, reported, even with those delays, I think in Minnesota, we have workarounds. We, can, we have things that can accommodate even those delays and give voters the experience they need to get their ballot in on time. So I'm really a glass half full uh, person when it comes to the post office. Yes, the reports are disturbing. And yes, uh, uh, many folks on the call yesterday uh, took that up with uh, the Postmaster General. But that's not going to slow us down and that's not going to stop us. Minnesotans want to vote this way. And even with delays, they'll be able to get around uh, any inconveniences. All right. Well, President Trump has also claimed without evidence that mail-in ballots have a higher risk of fraud, even saying without evidence that those ballots are more, more vulnerable to foreign interference. You were Secretary of State for the 2016 election, where nearly 700,000 Minnesotans voted absentee. Were there any credible cases of voter fraud from those ballots? No, there were not. And I have to say that it's unfortunate to hear that kind of disinformation and misinformation. In Minnesota, at least, we have a lot of different steps of security, starting with the fact that when you order that ballot, you have to provide some personal identifying information, last four of a social driver's license number. So unless it's returned with that same information, it's not going to be counted. So if a foreign government tries to uh, uh, fabricate or create a, a fake ballot, or if someone steals one out of someone's mailbox, they can send it in, sure. It's not going to be counted, and it never is. In Minnesota, I've asked the question, not just for 2016, but going back the last couple of decades, I've asked folks in the know, do you know of a single case, even one, where someone has uh, filled out a fake ballot or intercepted someone's ballot and successfully voted it? And the answer in Minnesota is no. They don't know of a single case in Minnesota in recent history. We have the security and we have the record to show that it's a safe and secure way to vote. And looking ahead to November, do you anticipate that Minnesota will be able to declare a winner on election night? Or do you think that voters should expect that it'll take several days or even weeks to count all the ballots? Here's what I think. By definition, we won't have all the ballots counted in Minnesota for one week because everyone's given that extra seven days to get their ballot in. But what I can say is I strongly suspect and predict that we'll have most of the outcomes or winners known well before that. I think in most contests, we will know the winner, if not on election night, very shortly thereafter. And that's because we'll be able to report not only all the ballots counted as of election night, but we'll also be able to say for particular contests, how many outstanding absentee ballots there are. And in most cases, for most offices in most contests, you're going to be able to mathematically call those races and figure out who the winner is. Even though you might not know by how much the winner won, until seven days has passed, you'll know who won in most of those contests. That I am confident of. Statistically speaking, we'll be able to tell. So what's the number one thing that you're most concerned about now that the votes are being cast in your state? To be honest, what I'm most concerned about is what happens after Election Day. I am concerned that in the week between Election Day and when 100% of ballots are counted, that that space could be filled with disinformation and misinformation from all sources, conspiracy theories, lies, uh, things designed to undermine confidence in our election, to suggest uh, bad motives where none exist. So I think not just in Minnesota, but nationwide, after the election, when, as we know, in Minnesota and most states, 100% of the ballots will not yet be counted. Let's just be calm. Let's be patient. Let's counter lies with truth and facts and talk about what's really going on, not 
what's in people's imaginations or what they believe is going on uh, uh, or what sinister plots they think are, are underway. Let's talk about what the system is designed to do and what it is doing, and let's not undermine our democracy or pollute it with things that just don't have any factual basis. That's my number one worry at this point. Secretary of State Steve Simon, we thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you coming on. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. What was Hurricane Sally just finally made it out to the sea, and there is already a series of new storms turning, but our Ginger Z has her eye in particular on one that just became Tropical Storm Beta. Ginger, no rest for the weary, my friend. What a busy hurricane season already. Just back, and I actually brought my boys because I thought I may have to leave again in two days, so I want to spend every moment here with them. That's how close together these are all happening. Three storms named just today. Just for reference, that's only ever happened once before in history in the late 1800s. But Beta is the one to watch. That's the one I want you to look at on the satellite imagery there. It's just hanging in the Gulf of Mexico, moving right now north-northeast at nine miles per hour. What's going to happen with this is it's got a lot of influences and a lot of uncertainty. So the track, as you see it right now, starts to make its way toward Texas by early next week. You see that cone, though, that goes all the way from Mexico and Brownsville up to Lake Charles. Remember, Lake Charles was hit so badly by Laura and Cameron included, too. One thing I can promise you, no matter what happens, you're going to end up with significant tropical moisture, 10 to 15 inches of rain, anywhere from Corpus Christi to, again, right there along coastal Louisiana. But even Alexandria could pick up a half foot of rain. So this is going to be significant in rain alone. We also have to talk about Teddy. You also recall that Bermuda just got hit by Paulette. Well, now it looks like a near miss. They're going to be on the left side, which is the better side of Teddy as it slides past. We in the East Coast here could even see some high surf and rip currents from this. Uh, not that anybody's probably swimming. Uh, this weekend going to be very cold. I've got my winter coat on now. If I go back uh, south, I'll have to dry out the raincoat, Lindsay. Lots of drying out, I'm sure, all around for you. Our chief meteorologist, Ginger Z, thanks so much. And turning now to the disaster on the West Coast, the battle against those wildfires now taking the life of a firefighter on the front lines of the fire burning in the National Forest east of L.A. It comes as crews are bracing for dangerous conditions to return this weekend. Our Kaylee Hartung has the latest. Tonight, the California wildfire sparked by a gender reveal celebration taking the life of a first responder. The U.S. Forest Service confirming a firefighter was killed overnight while battling the El Dorado fire near San Bernardino. New video shows the fire flaring up, crews fighting flames on both sides of Highway 38 in rugged mountains. This afternoon, a solemn procession carrying the firefighter's body through the charred landscape. Officers later saluting the flag-draped gurney. Wildfires now claiming the lives of at least 36 people out west this year. The wind-fueled Bobcat fire just north of Los Angeles, another big concern tonight, forcing new evacuations in Juniper Hills. An orange haze there blotting out the sun. The wind just driving flames towards homes here. The fire is right behind the house up on the little hill up there, and I just said, screw this. That fire inching dangerously close to the famed Mount Wilson Observatory. The smoke even closing Yosemite National Park, marring its natural beauty. And in Oregon, storms bringing relief from the toxic smoke, but the downpours threatening the fire-ravaged communities with landslides and flash flooding. Lindsay, the El Dorado fire here is 66% contained, but you can see it's still active. That firefighter's death is a reminder just because the containment numbers are up doesn't mean the risk decreases. And this weekend, there is a potential for conditions to take a dangerous turn. We expect it to be hot and dry throughout the state of California. So the risk to life and property, it is far from over. Now, this now makes three fire personnel deaths in California wildfires so far this year. Lindsay. Our thanks to Kaylee. And turning now to the major decision by the Trump administration banning the popular social media apps TikTok and WeChat from U.S. app stores effective this Sunday. So what does that mean for you exactly? Our business correspondent Deirdre Bolton is here now to break it all down. So Deirdre, if you have TikTok on your phone already, are you impacted? And what does this mean for its roughly 100 million users here in the U.S.? 
Yeah, 100 million users, we cannot ignore that number. Part of the reason why the Trump administration is not ignoring it, of course, Lindsay. So right now, if you already have the app, honestly, nothing happens to you until November 12th. So you can still post all the short videos or view the short videos that make you laugh, whether it's pets or recipes or comedy acts. So none of that changes until November 12th. One caveat, though, to that is that if there is is an update or somehow you receive just a prompt from the app to change something, you will not be able to make any changes, mostly updates, as of Sunday. Now, if you don't already have the app, the Commerce Department said if you don't have it by midnight on Sunday, you will not be able to download it if you are living in the U.S., Lindsay. All right, and why did the Trump administration make this move? And what is TikTok saying about all this? So the Trump administration made this move because if we can remember, go back in time, pre-pandemic, one of the bigger focal points of the Trump administration was U.S. and China and addressing what the Trump administration considered truly an imbalance between the world's two largest economies. The Trump administration felt that the U.S. was never treated fairly, if you like, always felt that China got the upper hand. You recall in 2018, the U.S. essentially kicked off a trade war started imposing tariffs, China retaliated. So there's just been growing tension between the two largest economies in the world since at least 2018. Questions of intellectual property, accusations that China steals a lot from U.S. companies. So this has really been a big theme, which post-pandemic, in some respects, we've sort of lost sight of, if you like. But the main charge here from the Commerce Department against TikTok is that the owner, ByteDance, is Chinese, and the Commerce Department says that's a security threat. In other words, maybe we all think it's silly because these short videos are fun and they're lively and they're very much part of our social media scene. But for example, I spoke with one expert, uh, Mark Douglas, and he's the CEO of Steelhouse. He, it's a tech and media firm. And he said, yeah, maybe it seems silly, but maybe a senator's niece or nephew posts TikTok. And if that information, if that data lives somewhere else, in foreign servers, perhaps that does represent a serious security risk. As for TikTok's comment, Lindsay, I'm just going to read you uh, right from their point here, essentially saying that they are disappointed and they say that they have really been cooperating with the Commerce Department. However, they are diplomatic in saying they hope a situation or rather a solution can be reached. It says, uh, disappointed with the Commerce Department's decision, saying it already had committed to unprecedented levels of additional transparency, Lindsay. And and of course, it's not just TikTok. WeChat will effectively be banned from the U.S. on Sunday, and not just new downloads of the app. Why is WeChat being banned as well, and what impact might that have on its users here in the U.S. and in China? WeChat, to a certain extent, had a target on its back. It is owned by Tencent, which is a huge Chinese conglomerate. Some people here think of it sometimes like Amazon. It's $650 billion market cap. If you look at the Hong Kong market, it has everything. It has cloud computing. It has gaming. It has entertainment. And it has this messaging service, WeChat. And really, people can do tons of things with it. They can send money. They can order food. They can chit-chat with friends. So for a lot of people uh, who are living in the U.S. with families in Asia, this has been a lifeline. And as of Sunday midnight, Lindsay, they will not be able to send money to their families or receive money from their families in China. Lindsay? Wow. Okay. Deirdre Bolton, thanks so much. And when we come back, the urgent search for a potential key witness in the investigation into the shooting of two deputies in their SUV. A new accusation of sexual assault against President Trump by a former model. But up next, despite making some improvements when it comes to representation, the Emmys continues to have a diversity problem. Actor John Leguizamo tells us why he's boycotting the big show right after the break. stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Singer-songwriter, Grammy winner, Oscar winner. Some people are just born this way. It's one of my skills. <laughs> Next week, Lady Gaga and her mom, Aisha Curry, Chris Rock, and Nancy Grace. Heat up your mornings on Good Morning America. Italians, they're the past. 
We're the future. We're the damn Roman Empire. Hey! Well, for years and years. What are they? Decorative? We're warning to the other rats. Are we good? You tell me. This is America, sir. Last time I checked, not Soviet Russia. Fargo, September 27th on FX. Next day, FX on Hulu. Right now, at this defining moment in America. <laughs> So much on the line. We gon' be all right. We gon' be all right. From ABC News, Turning Point, the groundbreaking month-long event. Every night, taking over, taking on. This moment for America. My America, your America, our America. This is Turning Point, the nightline month-long event. We gon' be all right. Late night on ABC. The Americans here on the ground and the Iraqis. 18,000 tons. Matatas. Ismail? Yes. David. David. Over ground zero from Hurricane Michael. You can see just home after home. David, thanks for meeting us. This was your view. My favorite view. Thank you for Thank you. Welcome back. The Emmy Awards are this Sunday night, hosted by Jimmy Kimmel, with celebrities beaming in from their homes. But despite the seemingly endless supply of content these days, there hasn't been as much diversity among award nominees. Our Janae Norman reports. Expect to see lots of new faces at the Emmy Awards this Sunday, because this year will feature the most diverse pack of Emmy contenders yet, with an historic increase in minority nominees. Who's stressed? Not you. Who the best? It's you. Congratulations, Octavia! Right here, ladies. This time, more than one-third of the actors vying to take home the coveted Golden Trophy are black. That's an increase of 33%, up 14% from each of the last five years. There are people who believe that this world is fair and good. It's all lollipops and rainbows. And more women are claiming their spots in major categories, such as writers and directors, making up some 36% of nominees, up 13% from last year. Ballroom is going to continue to be ballroom. And then there's the LGBTQ plus community. Are you ready? Celebrating increased recognition this year with 13 Emmy nods. Pause. Not including those shows with multiple Emmy nominations, featuring LGBTQ plus characters in lead roles. You do nothing at a startup that does nothing. They are starting up. And the first Muslim-American sitcom, Rami, also scored nominations with director Rami Youssef and Mahershala Ali, each earning Emmy nods. I'll count us in. Five, six, seven, eight. Sometimes some people don't think that award shows matter, but they do. It's a good signal and indicator of where the industry is at this moment, where society is, and where we can go forward. And with the new diverse class, I'm excited for it. Still, there's so much more work to be done. Pablo Bañol. This year, not a single Latinx talent stands to receive an Emmy in a major category. That's a total ripoff. In fact, only one Latino will even be competing, Alexis Bledel, for her guest starring role in A Handmaid's Tale. It's okay, honey. While actors from other popular Latinx shows like Vida, Pose, and One Day at a Time failed to make the cut. Okay. Even icon Rita Moreno Here we go. snubbed. And it's much the same for Asian performers, what? making up only 2% of nominations. No! With Killing Eve star Sandra Oh as the sole actor of Asian descent to be nominated in any of the major categories. This marks Oh's third consecutive nomination for that series. Janae Norman, ABC News. Our thanks to Janae. And one Emmy Award winning actor who will not be tuning into the award show this weekend is John Leguizamo. Now, this week, the actor told Yahoo News that he is boycotting the Emmys because of a lack of Latino representation. At more than 60 million strong, the Latino population in the United States is already the largest ethnic group in the country. Joining us now is a man who is taking it upon himself to not only educate, but is also on a mission to eradicate the erasure of Latinos in history, the arts, and beyond. Mr. John. John Leguizamo. John, thanks so much for joining us. Well, thank you. That's quite an intro. <laughs> <laughs> With the drum roll and everything. I appreciate you. So you've been nominated multiple times for Emmys. You've also won an Emmy. What do you think caused the Academy to fall so short this year when it comes to including Latinos? 
Well, obviously, it's it's a reverse engineering problem. You know, it's not really the Emmys that are the problem. It's before that, like who's casting, what stories are they telling? If you don't create great Latin roles, how are we going to get nominated? If you don't tell Latin stories, how do we get nominated? It's impossible. You know, if you're not casting us, you, we're not getting awarded. And your new movie, Critical Thinking, is based on the true story of five Miami teens who defied the odds and went on to become national chess champions. The movie hits on so much intersectionality. I want to play a quick clip that captures some of that in a scene between you and the principal of the high school. Give up on them. Let their parents give up on them. Let the whole system give up on them. But you know what? I ain't, okay? You really capture the obstacles of an underfunded education system, poverty, prejudice, even immigration that this teacher, Mario Martinez, had to overcome just so these kids could play chess. Why was it so important for you to make sure that this story was told? Well, because I, I believe there's so many gifted, talented, genius Latin and black kids in, in our communities that don't get nurtured, that don't get seen, that don't get the money or the supplies. And, and, and it's tragic, but this one teacher, Mary Martinez, in 1998, got them the nurturing they needed, saw them, respected them, and got them the money to become United States national chess champions, which is an incredible feat any, at any time at any economic group. In a recent interview with the Associated Press, you said Latinos are 25% of the U.S. box office, we're 30% of the public school population, and our kids don't see themselves. It's incredible. It's like we're living in a cultural apartheid, like we don't exist. We're here, we contribute money, taxes, and yet we're virtually invisible. Given the current climate with social change and justice happening in our country, do you believe that real change is coming for the Latino community? I, I really feel like it's starting to really happen. I, I feel. Publishers are, are, are really reaching out. Uh, studios are reaching out. Uh, production companies are really reaching out and, and asking themselves, what can we do to, to be inclusive? What, what, and you know that New York Times article that showed exactly how many Latin and black people and Asian people are the, the gatekeepers, are the leaders, are the executives. And you saw the dearth. And I think that's where the problem happens is because if, if you have Latin people and black people telling and LGBTQ and women telling their stories and picking the stories, you're going to see those stories. The Latin community has been disproportionately impacted uh, by COVID in multiple ways, particularly because they're overrepresented in many of the industries considered essential. In your one-act Broadway play, Latin History for Morons, you talk about the role of the Latino worker in the U.S. At one point, you even say Latin life is cheap in America. This pandemic has been a painful time for so many, but how has it impacted you personally seeing your community hit so hard? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's sad, you know, uh, knowing that they're not getting the respect that they deserve, especially in New York City, the neighborhood that I grew up, Jackson Heights, was the hardest hit in New York, uh, the most deaths, the most infections, uh, obviously, because you're right, like you said, they're the essential workers, they're the ones feeding us, growing the food and delivering it and making sure that, that we're getting fed and taking care of about almost all our services. Uh, so it, it's sad that such a community that, that's willing to give and, and serve America in so many ways doesn't get that love back. So that, that, that's where I think the, the, the problem lies. Of course, it's a presidential election year and you've thrown your support behind Joe Biden. Which of his platforms do you think really prove that he understands the needs and the nuance of the Latino community? Well, well I, I think the jobs creation is huge. Uh, I think uh, the the uh, protecting the Affordable Care Act and protecting uh, pre-existing conditions that's huge for the Latin community, uh, and 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 I'm glad that he's behind all the, all those uh, uh, platforms. John Leguizamo, ladies and gentlemen, we so appreciate you coming on the show. Thanks for your time, John. <laughs> Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you. You're the best. <laughs> Still ahead here on Prime, the newly released 911 call from Jerry Falwell Jr.'s wife that took place just days after those allegations emerged about the couple's relationship with a pool attendant. The Zoom chat between Brad and Jen that has the internet collectively losing its mind. And our partners at 538 are tracking the Senate races, what they say about which party is more likely to gain control after the election. Stay tuned. First, our tweet of the day, 50 years later, the music of Jimi Hendrix lives on.
In times like these, the newsmaking events happen here. ABC News. President Trump meeting face to face with one of the world's most brutal dictators, Kim Jong Un. The president. Do you trust him? I do trust him, yeah. I think he trusts me and I trust him. Ivanka Trump. I have to ask you about your emails. Your father had taken Hillary Clinton to task for this. There just is no equivalency. So the idea of lock her up doesn't apply to you? No. <laughs> Comey. How strange is it for you to sit here and compare the president to a mob boss? Very strange. Michelle Obama. What do you wish you could tell your pre-White House self? Whew. Melania Trump. Do you think there's still people there that he can't trust? Yes. Still working out? Yes. Michael Cohen. So he's still lying? Yes. It's a big statement. And now, in a year with so much on the line, we're right there. Good evening tonight from Washington, a very busy news night. America's number one news source, ABC News, straightforward. We all need someone who'll pull no punches and give it to us straight. No bull, no spin. Now, imagine getting your news like that. Just give it to me straight. ABC News, straightforward. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, free on Apple Podcasts. Now could be a good time to have another baby. Are you crazy? I'm in love with you. Now that I said it out loud, it does sound weird. <laughs> I feel so Please stop. When I see were so fine I had to remind myself to breathe let's do this how's your quarantine going <sighs> Welcome back, everybody. We've certainly been focusing a lot on the 2020 presidential race, but tonight we turn to the U.S. Senate, which hangs in the balance. Our partners at 538 have just launched their 2020 Senate election forecast, and they found that as of now, Democrats are slightly favored to take control of the Senate. Here are the details by the numbers. Democrats have a 58 percent chance of flipping the Senate in November. That's according to simulation forecast by 538, while Republicans have a 42 percent chance of holding on to their Senate majority. Here are some closely watched races. Majority Leader Mitch McConnell has a 95 percent chance of winning re-election and Lindsey Graham has an 85 percent chance of victory. Meanwhile, astronaut Mark Kelly, a Democrat, has a 78 percent chance of beating Republican incumbent Martha McSally in the red state of Arizona. And in what's looking to be the closest Senate race this year, Democrat Sarah Gideon has a 53 percent chance of ousting Republican incumbent Susan Collins in Maine. As we enter this election, Republicans have just a three Senate seat majority, and now 35 states are in play. That's out of a total of 100 Senate seats. And still lots to get to here on crime. The first target of the new security law in Hong Kong was a major tabloid read by protesters. Its media mogul owner recently arrested. We speak with him as the fight for the soul of that city continues. Another weekend of college football is upon us, but not everyone is satisfied with the COVID protocols in place. And why is Estee Lauder sending items to space? We'll explain, but first, a look at our top, top trending stories on abcnews.com. of migrants goes back two miles. There is going to be catastrophic damage. This fire has made a run. You can see those flames shooting up into the sky. We are on the jam-packed red carpet. To the right, guys. So this is the fourth week end of protest. <laughs> Watch NBC News on location for Facebook Watch. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live, the 24-7 streaming news source from ABC News. Breaking news, live events, streaming nonstop. Original breakthrough storytelling from ABC News, National Geographic, ESPN. And it's all designed differently for you to stream straight to any screen whenever you want. ABC News Live. Streaming everywhere right to you. ABC News Live. It's that easy to go there. Welcome to Disney Plus. Are you ready? Drop in and explore the action. 
The adventure and the originals. There's no limit to what you'll find. These are your worlds. So come on, dive deeper into the universes you love, wherever and whenever you want them. You'll find them all here on Disney+. Plus. It's being called the most consequential election of a lifetime, the most important vote, and with so much on the line, it demands the most straightforward, newsmaking, real answers, the most informed voices from all sides. The countdown is on to the vote. What will our future look like? ABC's This Week with George. It all plays out right here every Sunday. The most consequential week yet of this hyper-political year. Right as you get closer to casting your vote every Sunday on ABC. Coronavirus confusion continues with the CDC suddenly reversing its testing guidelines yet again Friday. Now saying you do need a test if you've been in close contact with someone who has tested positive for COVID-19. This comes after a new report in the New York Times said testing guidance posted to the CDC's website last month was not approved by its own scientists. Those guidelines said people without COVID-19 symptoms, even those exposed, do not need to get tested. That reportedly came from the Department of Health and Human Services and the White House Coronavirus Task Force instead. HHS Assistant Secretary and White House Testing Coordinator denying those allegations on ABC's Good Morning America. It absolutely came from the CDC. Um, there are thousands of people at the CDC. I have no idea who the New York Times talked to, but I know for a fact that the version that went to the task force was reviewed and approved by Dr. Redfield. Gloved, masked, and socially distanced, not even a pandemic could keep some voters from the polls in Minnesota for the first day of early in-person voting. We are revved up to vote for our candidate. Um, just being able to vote and get it out of the way and not worry about um, super long lines on in November when it's chilly out. Minnesota is one of the key battleground states in the race for the White House, both Biden and Trump campaigning there today news in the case of the Los Angeles County deputies ambushed in their SUV. Authorities are now searching for a key witness seen on surveillance right there walking nearby the moment a gunman opens fire, wounding both deputies in Compton. The male deputy has been released from the hospital. The female deputy remains in intensive care. She is expected to recover. As Puerto Rico continues to struggle to fully recover from the devastation of Hurricane Maria three years ago, the White House today announcing $11.6 billion in federal funds to help rebuild the electrical grid system and the education system. We're undertaking the largest federal investment in Puerto Rico's history. We're bringing Puerto Rico back, and we'll have it done fairly quickly. That's a tremendous, that's a tremendous amount of money, but it's a very important amount, and I think you're going to see something terrific. Later this month, a rocket will head to the International Space Station carrying several bottles of Estee Lauder skin products. It's for a commercial. Now looks significantly smoother, radiant, more even toned. But it's not like Estee Lauder has astronauts on staff, right? So it'll be NASA astronauts doing the filming of these commercials as well. They're not allowed to appear in them, but they are paid for their efforts at more than $17,000. Estee Lauder has been promised these bottles will get a ride back to Earth rather than being discarded as space trash. The internet is going bananas over a live virtual table read of Fast Times at Ridgemont High. But it was this moment that really sent viewers over the top. Hi, Brad. You know how cute I always thought you were. I think you're so sexy. Gotta love a Brad and Jen reunion. Friday nights, 9, 8 central, true crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable, follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020, Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. COVID-19, what can you do to help protect yourself? Where can you get your questions answered? The new daily podcast from ABC News with Dr. Jennifer Ashton and a team of experts. Listen free on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast free on Apple Podcasts.
This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live, the 24-7 streaming news source from ABC News. Breaking news, live events, streaming nonstop. Original breakthrough storytelling from ABC News, National Geographic, ESPN. And it's all designed differently for you to stream straight to any screen whenever you want. ABC News Live, streaming everywhere right to you. ABC News Live, it's that easy to go there. The waters of the Outer Banks are unforgiving and full of riches for the fishermen who dare. The best of the Northern Fleet are heading south. But the locals know where the giants lie. And if you thought the waters were unforgiving, wait until the battle begins. Wicked Tuna Outer Banks. New episode Sundays at 9 on National Geographic. ABC News, honored, winner of four Edward R. Murrow Awards, including the most prestigious honor, overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news choice. ABC News, America's number one news source. Straightforward news, straight to the heart of the story. ABC News, straightforward. Welcome back. Now to the new accusation of sexual assault against President Trump by a former model who says he forcibly kissed and groped her at the U.S. Open back in 1997. The accuser claims that she was in town with her then boyfriend who was friends with Tr Trump. Tom Yamas has this report on why she has decided to come forward now. This morning, President Trump facing new accusations of sexual assault when he was a business mogul in the late 90s and married to Marla Maples. Former model and now mother Amy Doris speaking with The Guardian. She alleges Trump groped her in 1997 when she was 24. She says it happened at the U.S. Open tennis tournament in New York. And he just grabbed me and he just shoved his tongue down my throat and I was pushing him off and then that's when his grip became tighter and... Um, you know, his hands were kind of, it's like very gropey and all over, you know, my, my butt, my, my breasts, my back, like everything. Doris says she felt like she couldn't escape. It felt like a, an octopus was hugging onto me. You just picture those suction cups on an octopus and they're stuck on you and there's like, you're trapped. That's how I felt. I felt trapped. According to The Guardian, Doris provided the U.S. Open ticket and several photos showing her with the real estate magnet over several days in New York. The Guardian also reports Doris says she told people at the time about the incident and years later who corroborate her version of what happened. The president's lawyers deny the allegations, telling ABC News the allegations are totally false. This is just another pathetic attempt to attack President Trump right before the election. Doris now joining a list of at least 17 women who have accused the president of inappropriate behavior, including sexual assault and rape. The president says they are all lying. But Trump infamously bragged about lewd conduct towards women in that 2005 leaked Access Hollywood video. When you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. Whatever you want. Grab them by the <laughs> Doris says she decided to come forward now because of her twin teenage daughters. I want them to know that you don't, you don't let anybody do anything to you that you don't want. And I'd rather be a role model. I want them to see that I didn't stay quiet. We have some breaking news just into our newsroom. According to a statement from the Supreme Court, Associate Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg died this evening, surrounded by her family at her home in Washington, D.C., due to complications of metastatic pancreatic cancer. She was 87 years old. We'll, of course, have much more on her life in just a moment. But first, our Juju Chang has more on the life of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a force to be reckoned with. All I ask of our brethren is that they take their feet off our necks. Barely five feet tall, but a liberal giant. Thank you, thank you. Only the second female justice named on the Supreme Court, serving there for more than a quarter century. Her path to the highest court in the land was not easy. As one of the few women at Harvard Law School, she faced discrimination after graduating from Columbia in the 50s. 
Her tenaciousness in the classroom highlighted in the Oscar-nominated documentary on Ginsburg titled RBG, produced by journalists Julie Cohen and Betsy West. She was one of nine women in a class of 500. She was tied for first in her class. And the big New York City law firms just weren't hiring women. Not a law firm in the entire city of New York bid for my employment. Charging forward, she became a beloved law professor at Rutgers and worked as a lawyer for the ACLU. She mapped out a legal strategy to file lawsuits against gender bias in employment, housing, and government benefits. Men and women are persons of equal dignity and they should count equally before the law. You won't settle for putting Susan B. Anthony on the new dollar. <laughs> <laughs> when they would say things like this. How did you respond? Well, never in anger, as my mother told me. That's, that would have been self-defeating. Always as an opportunity to teach. I did see myself as kind of a kindergarten teacher in those days because the judges didn't think sex discrimination existed. Well, one of the things I tried to plant in their minds was Think about how you would like the world to be for your daughters and granddaughters. She won five landmark cases, which she argued on behalf of women in front of an all-male bench long before she sat on it. Ginsburg went on to serve as an appeals court judge in the nation's capital until that life-changing nomination by President Bill Clinton in 1993. I am proud to nominate for Associate Justice of the Supreme Court Judge Ruth Bader Ginsburg. That announcement may never have happened had it not been for the intense lobbying effort by a staunch feminist, her husband, Marty Ginsburg. He really felt she was brilliant and, and she deserved it and it would be good for the country. And at her confirmation hearing, chaired by then Senator Joe Biden, the nominee did not shy away from her feminism, spotlighting contentious topics like abortion rights. This is something central to a woman's life to her dignity. It's a decision that she must make. The Senate confirmed her in a sweeping 96 to 3 vote. She began quickly making her mark on historic cases. She's perhaps best known for a decision in 1996 that struck down a male-only admissions policy at the Virginia Military Institute, opening the door for women to study there. It's Justice Ginsburg writing an opinion that builds on the foundations that lawyer Ruth Bader Ginsburg essentially helped to lay. I know that there were some people who did not react well to the change. And my response to this was, wait and see. You will be proud of the women who become graduates of VMI. And in a landmark case on employment discrimination in 2007, Ginsburg wrote a powerful dissent that prompted Congress to amend the laws. Named for the woman who filed the claim, the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act became one of the first pieces of legislation signed into law by President Barack Obama. Yeah. While on the Supreme Court, Justice Ginsburg was a consistently liberal voice on issues like abortion, voting rights, and the separation of church and state. Off the bench, she was the first Supreme Court justice to perform a same-sex marriage ceremony. Her tenure was not without controversy, breaking tradition for a justice when Ginsburg spoke out against then-candidate Donald Trump, including to the New York Times, calling him a, quote, faker, saying, I can't imagine what the country would be with Donald Trump as our president. Ginsburg later adding that her comments were, quote, ill-advised and that she regretted making them. But throughout it all, Justice Ginsburg won the respect of many conservatives with her grasp of the law and her carefully crafted opinion. And as the court shifted to the right, her scathing dissents elevated her to a pop culture icon, inspiring legions of young fans and feminists to emulate her famous outspokenness. 25, 24, 23. And her fitness routines, earning her the hip-hop-inspired nickname Notorious RBG. 
many varieties. Her fame, burnished by her fashion statements, her distinctive collars becoming her calling card. And this is what I use for announcing majority opinion. This one is for dissenting opinion. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg helped focus our country on its most basic values of justice and equality, leaving a legacy of majority opinions and powerful dissents for generations to come. Our thanks to Juju and now let's bring in Devin Dwyer. Devin, you got a chance to know uh, beyond uh, the black robe, Ruth Bader Ginsburg as a, a person. Give us a sense of, uh, of who she is and, and what she was like. Hey, Lindsay, yeah, I met Ruth Bader Ginsburg in her chambers uh, just about a year ago. She was battling a cold that day. Uh, it was before this latest recurrence of cancer, and I was struck by her humility, her absolute focused dedication to the law. And, you know, despite the caricatures of her out there, the Hollywood portrayals, she's, of course, been in some movies, portrayed in movies of late, I found her to be an incredibly serious, thoughtful, and constructive person. And that's what we're hearing tonight uh, from the Chief Justice. Justice uh, of the Supreme Court, John Roberts, who, of course, was uh, appointed by a Republican president. He says Ginsburg was a jurist of historic stature, uh, a cherished colleague, and says that today the court mourns, but with confidence uh, the court will remember her as we knew her, a tireless and resolute champion of justice. Lindsay. And we saw her in that piece. She was often known for working out every day, that rigorous exercise. <laughs> she had had pancreatic cancer before, uh, seemed to have beat it, and then had this recurrence again. Talk to us about um, the strength uh, that she exuded and, and her ability to overcome all uh, a number of, of health ailments. She came to symbolize uh, just unbelievable strength, Lindsay, particularly for women uh, in a man's world. She was the second woman appointed to the U.S. Supreme Court, served there uh, for over a quarter century. And so this passing of Ruth Bader Ginsburg is not just the loss of a legal luminary and a public servant for all that time, but of course, this is a pop culture icon, a woman that captured our imagination by her, her ability to defy death four times and serve a valiantly to the very end. In fact, uh, just last term, she participated in the court business. You remember from the hospital room uh, as she was fighting an infection asking questions uh, over the phone. And so uh, that strength and determination felt by so many women and minorities fighting for equality uh, was her cause, and she sure was relentless and undaunted in that way. You know, there's a quote that she said, women will only have true equality when men share with them the responsibility of bringing up the next generation. As much as she was a pioneer in her own right, uh, her husband uh, really was, was such a, a strong advocate as well. Yeah, it was a partnership in marriage, and boy, did she miss uh, Marty Ginsburg, who passed away a few uh, many years ago uh, from cancer himself. He was a chef. Uh, it, their marriage was a partnership, and it was a modern marriage, one she was so proud of. In fact, in our meetings, she talked regularly uh, of Marty uh, as she knew him, and um, it, it, you know, and in that way, she she used her partnership with her husband uh, to create some of the legal arguments. Lindsay, I mean, she when she was before the Supreme Court, her she made a targeted appeal not just for women's rights, but for men's rights on the basis of sex was very much an argument. She wanted it to be equal for both sides. Uh, and one of her famous cases took up the cause of, uh, of a widower who, um, who was struggling with Social Security. And so um, certainly Marty uh, is, is she's together with Marty tonight. You know, it's certainly so early, Devin, uh, to even begin uh, to talk about it, but certainly a lot of people are going to be asking what's next, and with the election less than two months away, what does this mean as far as President Trump being able to possibly uh, push through another nominee? Well, this, in many ways, uh, Lindsay, was her worst nightmare. She never uh, herself wanted to leave it to a Republican president, much less Donald Trump, to name her replacement. Uh, and tonight, Democrats are experiencing a nightmare they had hoped to avoid. Uh, there has never been, um, you know, a, a, an appointment and confirmation of a Supreme Court justice this late in the game with a divided Congress like we have uh, right now. So Republicans are vowing to do it. President Donald Trump uh, has said openly 
recently at some of his campaign rallies that he would nominate someone and put them forward. So we are uh, all braced for a pitched political battle, but for the next uh, few days or so, it's worth keeping the focus uh, on a legendary justice uh, who uh, uh, members on both sides of the aisle tonight uh, are remembering. ABC's Devin Dwyer, our thanks to you. And we'll, of course, have much more on the death and passing of Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg throughout the night. Please stand by while we join the rest of the ABC News television network. How dramatically do you think this will change the dynamic of the election coming up? There, there's so many open questions, Byron. Number one, remember, uh, will, will President Trump, we know he's going to nominate someone close to immediately. He has a list ready. He has a majority in the Senate, a Republican majority in the Senate right now. Will he be able to force through a replacement for Ruth Bader Ginsburg in the less than seven weeks that remain until Election Day in the lame duck session that comes after that? Uh, it's an open question. Remember what happened when uh, Justice Scalia died at the end of President Obama's term, Mitch McConnell, the Senate Republican leader, said, we're not going to approve, we're not going to give hearings to any replacement that, that uh, President Obama appoints in an election year. He has now gone back on that rule saying, well, that's different because we have a president and Republican of the same party. It's unclear at this point whether uh, Democrats will have the votes to to block any appointment that the president would make in these final seven weeks. But this will become an immediate issue in the election. It's an open question on whether or not President uh, Trump will be able to replace Justice Ginsburg. Uh, but it will it will become immediately the central issue, the central issue in this election. And George, a final question: your, your fondest memory of the justice. <laughs> Well, I actually was in the in in the White House when when President Clinton appointed her uh, back in 1994, uh, 1993, and it was, you know, she has such presence, had such history, and she had such strength that she carried throughout her life it's a, it, it's just it's hard to summarize mm. in one word or one sentence her contributions uh, to american life but she made her mark on the law she made her mark on the culture she made her mark on politics and she will be remembered for a long time amen abc news chief anchor george stefanovis george thank you so much we're joining now to, uh, we're talking now uh, via phone to ABC News Chief White House Correspondent, Jonathan Carl. Jonathan, what's been the reaction, if any, to this point at the White House? Byron, nothing yet, uh, but l let me tell you, I, I think that George hit it, uh, hit the nail on the head here about the fact that this now suddenly becomes if not the central, certainly a central issue in this campaign. 46 days left. Uh, Donald Trump, I, we, we don't have any official word on this, but I fully anticipate he will attempt uh, to, to fill that seat on the Supreme Court. It's hard for me to see that there is enough time uh, to, uh, to get a justice uh, confirmed, um, to go through confirmation hearings and to get a final vote in, in, the, in the Senate. But, but they will try, I believe, leave, um, and, and this will be something that will be all-consuming in this, in this campaign. Uh, you know, she was uh, obviously more than just a Supreme Court justice. She was an American icon. She was also uh, the, uh, the, the, the liberal heart of the Supreme Court. I mean, she, the Supreme Court, as you know, Byron, so well, is, is so is evenly divided. It's a it's a conservative majority right now, a five four majority, but that fifth vote is Justice Roberts, who sometimes joins with with the liberals, and the idea of Donald Trump replacing the liberal core of the court with another justice like Kavanaugh or Gorsuch would 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 tilt the uh, the, the court decisively, perhaps for a generation, uh, to to the right, and this is something that. Um, it, 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 it will, Democrats will fight and fight and fight, uh, you know, with everything they have over the next uh, 46 days. And John, we, we, we've known for a while now that she's had some serious health challenges, but was there any indication in and around the White House that this was imminent? 
you know, the White House did not have any visibility, as far as I can tell, onto the tr- into accurately what the extent of her health issue was. But obviously, they knew uh, that, that it was serious. And as 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 you saw, that just uh, recently, the president listed his potential Supreme Court uh, nominees for, for future picks. Now, this is something he did in the last campaign. This was something he was, you know, this is part of his campaign, his message to, uh, to, to, to the right. If I am reelected, I will promise you that I will pick my Supreme Court nominees if I get any from this list. So, look, they've been prepared for this eventuality, uh, but I don't think that they had any more knowledge uh, into her health condition than you or I did. And John, a final question. Do we expect to hear from President Trump or get any, any kind of word from the White House tonight? Uh, I've got nothing on that right now, uh, Byron. I've been on the phone with you here for a little bit, mm-hmm. so it's it's you know possible that, uh, that that there is word out there. But I you know I expected that the president, <laughs> as you know, the president watches the news more closely than most people that, that, that work in the news, and I'm sure he will have a response. I'm sure that there will be um, a, a, a response that is first a, a tribute to, to Ruth Bader Ginsburg, um, uh, and then very quickly after that, uh, a question about next steps. But, but the first step I, I would fully anticipate from the president will be a tribute to, to the death of, a, of an American you know, to, to, to an American icon who has just died. Jonathan Carl, ABC's chief White House correspondent. Thank you so much, my friend. We're going to be joined now uh, uh, on the phone with Mary Bruce, our congressional, our chief congressional correspondent. Mary Bruce, what's been the reaction on the Hill? Well, we are still, of course, keeping a close eye to see how Congress reacts. But, of course, everyone wondering, what are Republicans going to do next? The Republican leader in the Senate, Mitch McConnell, has made very clear that he will try to fill this seat, even though we are now under 50 days to an election. Timing here is going to be critical. They don't have a lot of time, just until a transition in early January, to try and fill this seat. But Leader McConnell has made very clear that is his intention, even though, of course, it is uh, the opposite of an argument that he made uh, when there was the fight over trying to appoint Merrick Garland to fill the seat by Justice Scalia. In 2016, at the time, Mitch McConnell, of course, said that it would be up to voters to make that decision. But now he says this is a very different situation. He says it is a a completely different game, essentially, because he says currently, of course, Republicans are in control of the Senate and of the White House. He says that changes the calculus. Uh, Democrats, though, say that is simply uh, splitting hairs. They are going to try and delay this. And, of course, remember, because of the rules currently, uh, Republicans can. They have the vote uh, to fill this seat. But, of course, uh, Democrats Democrats have the ability to try and delay and delay and delay, and I suspect that you will certainly uh, see that. Uh, Trying to fill this seat, of course, is a uh, potentially risky move for for Trump and for Republicans. Um, A lot of eyes now are on moderate Republicans, a handful of critical moderate Republicans, several incumbents who are in tight races. Uh, Could they potentially be swayed? to try and uh, oppose a rush to fill this seat. It, of course, just takes four votes to flip this, uh, to try and block whoever the president puts forward. Um, I think right now the Hill, much like the White House, as John Carl says, is simply trying to uh, absorb this news, uh, this tragic loss for the country. But, of course, everyone, given the timing of this, this now completely changes the calculus as we head into this election and all eyes now on Senate Republicans and their next move. Mary, some news is just coming in to us. ABC News has confirmed from several sources close to President Trump that he will put forward in the next few days the name of his nominee. That does not surprise me. Of course, we know that the president is is eager to to, to try and and build this seat, maintain the balance uh, or change the balance on the court, of course. Um, You know, this is, as we mentioned, a lengthy process. You know, there is time to try and fill this seat, but this is not something that happens instantaneously. There, of course, you know, you have hearings, you have a nominating fight, you have uh, plenty of time, of course, for whomever is put forward uh, to to go through a certain vetting process. But Republicans, I suspect, are going to try and, and do their hardest to push through whomever the president may name. Mary, a, a final question. Any sense of what kind of nominee, we, uh, certainly we know it'll be a conservative, what kind of nominee we expect the, the, uh, the president will put forward? 
Well, he has, you know, floated some names, but but certainly, you know, everyone is wondering exactly who this will be. We do know, of course, that it will be uh, a very conservative uh, justice. I suspect the president very interested in trying uh, to change the balance. But it is just such a monumental decision, and he, he will have to pick someone who is not too controversial, someone, of course, who can uh, potentially be confirmed in now what is a very short amount of time. And certainly we have seen uh, his previous nominees uh, face an intense scrutiny. Justice Kavanaugh's confirmation hearing uh, it was something that I think was certainly not the way uh, that, that the president and many expected it to go down. So there, this, if the president wants to do this quickly, it is going to have to be something someone that Republicans uh, can unite around, especially getting the support of uh, vulnerable Republicans who are in difficult political positions right now. Mary Bruce, ABC's chief congressional correspondent, thank you so much. Joining us now via phone is Kate Shaw, longtime Supreme Court correspondent. Kate, your reaction to this news and what are you hearing from your sources at the Supreme Court? Well, you know, I, I share the sense that George and others have voiced that this is just an, uh, you know, a, a, a huge upheaval in American law, in American life, that she was a giant. Um, and so I think we are all still absorbing the news, although, of course, everyone knew that she was sick and was undergoing treatment for cancer. She did appear in public as recently as a week or a, a week and a half ago. So she did appear to be, you know, in decent health. So I think that this did take many by surprise. I mean, um, one thing I think we should say is that there are a lot of questions that, that, you know, so Roe versus Wade is something that no one has mentioned yet, and that is a decision that very much is hanging by a thread. There's an evenly divided Supreme Court with four staunch conservatives. There were until today four, four liberals. Chief Justice Roberts, as the new swing, uh, he cast a vote with the liberal justices just a few months ago to preserve the right to an abortion announced in Roe versus Wade in 1973, but only, again, by the narrowest of margins. And I think there is no question that if President Trump is successful in getting a replacement confirmed, Roe versus Wade will be overturned in the very near future. And in fact, that is what President Trump uh, promised himself on, you know, on the campaign trail uh, in 2016 and even before that. Um, so I think that that is very much what is at stake in this decision, Many uh, in, in, in this sort of confirmation battle. I mean, one other thing I'll say is that um, if the White House moves quickly to put a name forward, and it sounds as though they will, um, I presume they will choose someone who has been confirmed to a federal appeals court relatively recently and thus has been vetted. And so there is a degree of certainty that the process could be smooth. But as, as we saw with Brett Kavanaugh, sometimes the unexpected does occur in a confirmation process. Um, and of course, Christine Blasey Ford's coming forward nearly derailed his confirmation process. So there's a degree of uncertainty, even if the White House wants to move as quickly as it can, there's only so much that is within its control. We'll have certainly have plenty to talk about the net front for, for the days and weeks to come. But about Justice Ginsburg, we know how her fans felt about her. How about her peers in the Supreme Court? Well, she was fierce. I would say her colleagues on the court, the lawyers who argued before her, um, knew that when you were discussing anything with Justice Ginsburg, you had to bring your A game because she was the most prepared, the most well read, the most precise in her thinking and her analysis. She had very high standards for everyone around her, very high standards for herself. Um, and but I think because she imposed those same kinds of standards on herself, she was beloved and respected by virtually everyone who came into contact with her. I mean, she was famously close with Justice Antonin Scalia, who, of course, died in 2016. Though they disagreed on just about everything in American law, um, there was a degree of mutual respect and affection because they were both just, you know, such craftsmen um, and such – they were both at sort of the top of their respective games, uh, and they had a warm personal relationship. Um, I'm not sure she was as close to all of her colleagues on the court as that, um, but I think they all had a great deal of respect for her and, you know, just the American legal profession in general. General, um, she sort of was in a category of her own. Even before, in the last few years, she became this kind of icon in the wider culture, particularly to young people, right, who really embraced the notorious RBG. Kate Shaw, thank you so very much. For a final word, we're going to go back to ABC's chief anchor, George Stephanopoulos. George, for, for your, your, your final thoughts on this incredibly Dan, sad Dan. evening for our nation. Batten down the hatches, Byron. I mean, we, this is something we've never seen before. We are now less than seven weeks from presidential election. 
a Supreme Court justice has died, a Supreme Court justice whose death opens up the possibility of changing the balance on the Supreme Court, as Kate Shaw and John Paul said, for a generation. I would say in the coming days and weeks, to keep your eye not only on President Trump, not only on former Vice President Joe Biden, but on several key senators. Look at Susan Collins of Maine, Jody Ernst of Iowa, Cory Gardner of Colorado, Lisa Murkowski of Alaska, Tom Tillis of North Carolina, even Lindsey Graham, the chairman of the Senate uh, Judiciary Committee from South Carolina. The decisions those senators make in these coming days and weeks will determine the course of the Supreme Court, perhaps the course of the country, for another generation. Indeed. George Stephanopoulos. George, thank you so much. I know you have much more on Good Morning America in the morning. Thank you very much. Later, we'll have a comprehensive look at her life and legacy and online at abcnews.com. Again, Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg has died this evening at the age of 87. We'll have more developments throughout this evening. Thanks so much for watching. This has been a special report from ABC News. We'll join our... Our coverage continues right now on ABC News Live. I want to bring Devin Dwyer back in, who joins us on the phone. You know, when you think about just the times that we're living in and how incendiary they are, talk to us about the battle that is likely ahead as far as Trump trying to get in a, a nominee on the Supreme Court. I mean, George just said it, Lindsay, batting down the hatches. This is going to be an extraordinary political battle uh, up to the election and after the election during what's called the lame duck period. After we've picked our next president, you'll remember Republicans, of course, blocked Merrick uh, Garland in an election year, saying that we should leave it to the voters. Uh, here now, Republicans are vowing to, to push ahead. And what's at stake, and we heard uh, reporting from Mary Bruce there and Kate Shaw, is the whole balance of the court. Right now, it's a 5-4 split on the court between Republican-appointed justices and Democratic-appointed justices, with Chief Justice John Roberts, as we remember this term, really playing the man in the middle, the moderating force, siding with gays and lesbians in that uh, major employment case this term. Uh, but he may actually be pushed aside if a, a, a sixth a uh, Republican-appointed, very likely conservative nominee is added to this court by Donald Trump and successfully confirmed. Uh, and what I think it could set off, Lindsay, you're going to start to see Democrats warning of packing the court, changing the number of justices, uh, trying to do that at least, if they get control at some point down the line, to counter what Donald Trump has done here. So this is going to be a very ugly political battle that could have some serious ramifications for not just the future of the court, uh, but for some major cases in the pipeline as well. Right, potentially changing the balance on the Supreme Court, including, of course, Roe versus Wade. Let's bring in John Santucci, who's in Washington. John, what are you hearing right now from the Trump administration? Well, Lindsay, Catherine Falders and I have spoken to multiple sources close to the president tonight that say the president is expected to put forth a nominee to fill Ruth Bader Ginsburg's seat in the coming days. You know, this is not uh, awfully surprising in a sense, this president. You know, he has uh, been eager to leave his mark on the federal court system, has said repeatedly uh, throughout the campaign season, you know, that he always wanted to get another Supreme Court justice. It, it is unbelievable that this has happened, as Devin and George said. Uh, but my sources tell me, Lindsay, that, it, you know, in the last couple of days, as the White House was getting a sense uh, that Ginsburg was in failing health, uh, they started to meet with the president and discuss a list of individuals that would come forward. Uh, you might recall, uh, just in the matter of the last couple of weeks, uh, the president actually held an event where he announced his uh, extended list of potential nominees. That included dozens of individuals, including a few sitting United States senators. But I'm told tonight this list for a potential replacement for the Ginsburg seat is short. It includes at least one woman, and multiple sources tell us tonight, Lindsay, that one of the leading contenders there is federal judge Amy Coney Barrett. She has been on Donald Trump's shortlist before for the two previous vacancies he has had on the Supreme Court. Conservative judge, um, a mom, younger, um, and someone that the president um, had a, a good jive with. Uh, you know, he has interviewed her in person um, for the previous uh, seats that he had to fill. It didn't end up going 
rolling with her. But I am told by multiple sources she's a leading contender, still an early process, and we're going to learn a lot more in the coming days from the White House. John Santucci, thanks so much. Let's bring in Kate Shaw. Give us a sense you were mentioning a little while ago, just the importance of Roe v. Wade and the implications potentially here. I'm sorry, Dan Abrams, we're bringing in uh, our legal analyst, Dan Abrams here. Yeah. Dan, and, and same question actually to you, if you're able to, to kind of speak to yeah. the implications of Roe v. Wade here. So look, Roe v. Wade has been um, barely hanging on uh, for years now. And what I mean by that is there have been a lot of kind of technical rulings that have upheld Roe v. Wade. but. Always the reasoning has been, in effect, well, this isn't the right case, um, and or this, this specific issue has been addressed, et cetera. They haven't really been dealing with the fundamental question of, are we going to overturn Roe versus Wade? And you've had a few justices on the court say that they would uh, overturn Roe versus Wade. I think that, that you can't um, overstate how significant this is beyond just abortion, immigration, uh, voting rights. Um, it, it goes on and on and on in terms of the, the issues uh, where there have been five to four rulings um, where a flip from Ginsburg to a conservative justice will simply change the outcome. And that's not what we've seen up to this point with President Trump's choices. Remember, you had Justice Kennedy. Um, who, who stepped down. Um, he was replaced by Neil Gorsuch. Yes, a little more conservative than Kennedy, but not a fundamental change on the court. Uh, you have Scalia, um, uh, sorry, Sc Scalia um, to Gorsuch. And then you have the Kavanaugh uh, appointment uh, um, as well with regard to, 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 to Kennedy. So, so you, have, you have these changes that were not that significant in terms of the makeup of the court. When Ginsburg, now that Justice Ginsburg has died and the president is going to have the opportunity to appoint someone who will be somewhere between conservative to very conservative, it is going to fundamentally change a whole host of rulings in a way that we have not seen before. And so the fundamental question for the court is going to be, how much do they respect an issue which every Supreme Court justice has asked about? in their confirmation hearing, which is something called stare decisis, meaning how much do you give credence to previous rulings to say, we're going to keep that, we're going to respect the fact that the court has already ruled on that, versus simply overturning a whole host of Supreme Court precedents. And Dan, when you look at the time frame, the timeline here, as far as Election Day, which is about 50 days away, any way, if you can look into your crystal ball, that you can give an indication if you think um, that the Republicans would be able to get a nominee in? Well, look, the average amount of time these sorts of things take is about 70 days, right? Um, if, you, if you put in the 40-something the days from now until Election Day, you add a couple of months, you're right on the on the border there. The question's going to be, are they going to be able to get um, the, the 50 votes that they need? I don't think it's any question President Trump is going to try to get it through. The question is going to be, do they get it? Um, do they have those votes? And I think in part, that's going to depend on, <clears throat> excuse me, President Trump appoints. And I think he's going to be very strategic about this. He's going to try to appoint someone who has probably someone on an appellate court. You heard there uh, the reporting about the possibility of Amy Barrett. Um, someone who's already been confirmed to an appellate court. Um, and if that's the case, there's no question that Republicans could certainly try to move forward and probably could, if they have the votes, uh, move forward and confirm a nominee before uh, the uh, next president, be it Donald Trump for uh, four more years, or Joe Biden takes over in January of 2021.
I want to pass along, uh, we've heard from Senator Lindsey Graham, uh, who has just tweeted about the passing of RBG, saying it was with great sadness that I learned of the passing of Justice Ginsburg. Justice Ginsburg was a trailblazer who possessed tremendous passion for her causes. She served with honor and distinction as a member of the Supreme Court. While I had many differences with her on legal philosophy, I appreciate her service to our nation. My thoughts and prayers are with her family and friends. May she rest in peace. Uh, Kate Shaw, I'd like to bring you in here. What's interesting? here is that the senator gives his well wishes but does not give any particular indication as far as uh, where he will stand on filling her spot. We did hear uh, from Lisa Murkowski, uh, that senator today, saying that she will not confirm a new SCOTUS justice until after Inauguration Day. Fair is fair, she says. Kate, same question to you. What is your sense as far as how quickly things may happen and how important this is uh, for President Trump in what would potentially change the balance on the Supreme Court? You know, on the substance, the stakes just couldn't be higher, right? Um, in particular, I think that's true about abortion, where Roe versus Wade is hanging by a thread in the Supreme Court, you know, even the Supreme Court with Justice Ginsburg on it. That was true. Um, the Chief Justice, Chief Justice Roberts, cast the fifth vote narrowly to reaffirm, essentially, the right to an abortion uh, guaranteed in the Constitution under Roe versus Wade from 1973. But I think it's pretty clear that another staunch conservative justice on the court replied Placing Justice Ginsburg would spell the end of Roe versus Wade, uh, at least as we know it, and I think before too long, within the next couple of terms. So, and that's just one example. There are a lot of other areas of law in which a solid five-member conservative majority, um, you know, whether we're talking about the death penalty, criminal justice, uh, various election-related matters. I mean, the list is long. So, I do think on the substance, uh, this is just a massive development, um, and it would be huge if, if, for the balance of the court if President Trump were successful and having someone confirmed. You know, on the question of how possible it is, I, I don't—I think there's—it's it, very much an open question. Um, this typically does take, you know, months, at least, uh, from start to finish, right, identifying a candidate, having all of the vetting and background investigation completed, and then the Senate scrutiny and confirmation process. All of that can be accelerated, but, you know, I think it's a, it, it would be—I I, probably the fastest confirmation, um, certainly in the modern era, if it were to happen, you know, I, before the election seems almost impossible to me. The big question, I think, is November and December. And remember, we could be going into a season in which there is, you know, election-related litigation that the Supreme Court ultimately needs to resolve, right, questions about counting methods, questions um, about voting by mail. And so, you know, the court and the election are closely connected in more than one way. Um, but I, I think that a lot is going to turn on what some of these pivotal senators, you know, people like so Murkowski already spoke, but Susan Collins, I think, will be closely watched, and several other, you know, kind of modern, uh, moderate, rather, senators who may be unwilling to appear sort of hypocritical in light of the position in 2016, which was that in an election year, an outgoing president shouldn't be able to have a replacement uh, confirmed, but should have to wait for an intervening election. Kate, stay with us if you would. I'd like to bring in Governor Chris Christie here. Same question to you, Governor. You know, I was reading um, from The Hill uh, an article from June of 2019, where President Trump was asked a, a very similar question about a nominee and getting them in in short order. And he said, I'd do it if there were only three days left. I'd put somebody up hoping that I could get it done in three days, okay? Give us a sense of your thought as far as this timeline, how close we are to the election, the likelihood uh, that President Trump would be able to get a nominee in. Well, first off, Ritzy, I feel compelled to say that Ruth Bader Ginsburg was an extraordinary woman and, and an icon in, in our country. Um, she was a groundbreaker for women. Um, she was an extraordinary person who I had the good fortune to meet, extraordinary sense of humor on top of uh, an incredible mind. And so uh, no matter where you sit on the political spectrum tonight, this is a loss for the country to lose somebody like Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who has been such a pioneer um, it's such a wonderful person. So um, we can get some politics now, but I think that's the most important thing about tonight. The, the, the politics of this is pretty simple. And I think, um, I, I don't know who our last guest was, but, but I heard the tail end of her, her statement. And the key thing she said was an outgoing president. Now, we don't know that we have an outgoing president here. We could have a president who will be reelected on, uh, on November 3rd. And so 
you know, I think really, you know, with, given what we're concerned about, too, with the real potential for litigation over this election because of some of the really crazy stuff that's going on related to COVID in the country that will affect voting in a significant way. We already have a number of federal cases going on. It is not, uh, it is not unlikely that um, a, an election challenge could go all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court. You do not want a 4-4 court. In that, in that circumstance, because if you ever wound up with a 4-4 decision on a key matter, like let's say Bush versus Gore was, um, you know, throw the country into complete turmoil. So I think the Senate is going to talk, you know, with each other. There's no doubt in my mind that the president will nominate someone. Uh, he's been pretty clear on that. The real question now is in the hands of Senator McConnell. Um, he's going to have to talk to his caucus and see if he's got uh, 50 votes with Vice President Pence as a tiebreaker if necessary to be able to confirm a qualified candidate to fill Justice Ginsburg's seat. I think that's what's going to determine it. It's going to be up to Mitch McConnell as to whether he thinks he can get it done or he can't. This is much different than the Obama situation, in my view, because there was no doubt Barack Obama was leaving on January 20th of uh, 2017. Here, Donald Trump could very well be standing for his second inauguration on January 20th of 2021. And, of course, you've been kind of giving us some insight about the legality of it and the possibility of it. Talk to us about what this means for the country, which is already so divided, and the political football now at play. Well, there's no doubt, Lindsay, that, that this will, again, uh, people will go to their partisan corners for the most part. Um, I hope not everybody does, and, and I certainly won't. Uh, you know, I'm going to try to give the judgment to who the president nominates and see if they're a qualified candidate or not. But there's no doubt that, that will do it. But, you know, Lindsay, no matter when this happened, um, there was going to be, this was going to be an incredibly difficult decision if it was a Republican president replacing a liberal icon on the Supreme Court. In the very same way that there would be a lot of problems for a liberal president to be replacing a conservative icon, whether it was somebody like Sam Alito or, 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 or Claire Thomas. Um, you know, those kind of folks on the court, um, you know, would also be very difficult. So it, it will be high pitched. Um, it will be difficult, like everything is in politics right now. Um, and it's going to be up to Mitch McConnell. He's going to have to be able to read, as he does so very well, the mood of his caucus and whether or not he can bring them around to do something like this in the next couple of weeks. Governor Chris Christie, our thanks to you. Kate Shaw, I'd like to bring you back in here, taking a step back, because we did delve right into the politics of it all. Give us a sense in your estimation of the icon uh, that Ruth Bader Ginsburg, also known as Notorious RBG, was. You know, as a litigator and then as a justice, she fundamentally changed the face of American law. So she single-handedly kind of crafted a litigation strategy in the 1970s that got the Supreme Court to recognize that the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution didn't permit states to draw distinctions between men and women on the basis of outdated and stereotyped notions of, you know, men serving as breadwinners and women as caregivers, because there were thousands of laws in across the states that rested on those kinds of distinctions until the, you know, the young RBG sort of took aim at them one by one and litigated and won these cases that ended up, again, really changing the face of American law. So she was, you know, an incredibly important lawyer, you know, m years and years before she was a Supreme Court justice and a household name. So she sort of quietly crafted this litigation strategy at the ACLU in the 1970s um, and then was a law professor for many years, um, or actually did those two at the same time, uh, and then a judge on the D.C. Circuit and then elevated, of course, by President Clinton to the Supreme Court. Um, and, you know, she, tiny in stature, when you would go to arguments at the Supreme Court, you could almost not see her from behind the bench because she was so small, but just fierce when she opened her mouth. Um, always the most prepared, uh, incredibly insightful questions, uh, famously got her opinions drafted faster than anyone else on the bench, even as recently as May, when the court was hearing arguments telephonically because of the pandemic. Um, she was an active questioner, although we later learned she had had a recurrence of the cancer. Um, 
she had participated in one hearing from a hospital bed, um, but again, active and engaged, um, you know, almost never missed a day on the bench. Um, so, you know, just an incredibly important player in shaping the face of constitutional law um, and, you know, just a fierce justice, you know, I would say loved and respected and a little bit feared by everyone around her because she had such high standards, I think, for herself and everyone else. Um, so it's just a massive loss, you know, both personally for the, you know, Ameri body of American law and for the country more broadly. Right. Kate, to your point, she was barely five feet tall, but that tiny stature, despite that, she loomed larger in life and likely in death as well. Kate, thank you so much. Ginsburg was nominated by President Clinton back in 1993. She became the anchor of the liberal justices on the court and was affectionately known as RBG. Her words were closely followed along the way. Let's take a listen to RBG in her own words. If confirmed, I will take that counsel to heart and strive to write opinions that both get it right and keep it tight. A system of justice will be the richer for diversity of background and experience. It will be the poorer in terms of appreciating what is at stake and the impact of its judgments if all of its members are cast from the same mold. The announcement the president just made is significant, I believe, because it contributes to the end of the days when women, at least half the talent pool in our society, appear in high places only as one at a time performers. What has become of me could happen only in America. Like so many others, I owe so much to the entry this nation afforded to people yearning to breathe free. In my lifetime, I expect there will be, among federal judicial nominees, based on the excellence of their qualifications, as many sisters as brothers-in-law. It is a sign of huge progress made. To today's youth, judgeship as an aspiration for a girl is not at all outlandish. How fortunate I was to be alive and a lawyer when for the first time in U.S. history, it became possible to urge successfully before legislatures and courts the equal citizenship stature of men and women. We are a nation made strong by people like you people who have traveled long distances, overcome great obstacles, and made tremendous sacrifices, all to provide a better life for themselves and their families. A word about the notoriety I have recently attracted. <laughs> it is amazing that at my advanced age, 85, so many people want to take a picture with me. <laughs> so in the, in the days when I was a flaming feminist litigator, I never said to judges who asked an improper question, you sexist pig. <laughs> <laughs> and I went to a school Cornell University with a ratio, four men to every woman. It was the ideal place for parents of a daughter. <laughs> if you could not find your man at Cornell, you were hopeless. <laughs> I have had more than a little bit of luck in life, but nothing equals in magnitude my marriage to Martin D. Ginsburg. I do not have words adequate to describe my super smart, exuberant, ever-loving spouse. We sing of America 
sweet land of liberty. <laughs> Newcomers to our shores, people like you, came here from the earliest days of our nation to today, seeking liberty, freedom from oppression, freedom from want, freedom to be you and me. Without the determined efforts of men and women who kept dreams alive, dreams of equal citizenship in the, the days when few would listen. People like Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Harriet Tubman come to mind. I stand on the shoulders of those brave people. By limiting government, specifying rights, and empowering the people, the founders of the United States proclaimed that the heart of America would be its citizens, not its rulers. Some of you asked me during recent visits why I want to be on the Supreme Court. It is an opportunity beyond any other for one of my training to serve society. The controversies that come to the Supreme Court as the last judicial resort touch and concern the health and well-being of our nation and its people. They affect the preservation of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Serving on this court is the highest honor, the most awesome trust that can be placed in a judge. It means working at my craft, working with and for the law as a way to keep our society both ordered and free. Ruth Bader Ginsburg in her own words. Again, she has passed away at just 87 years old. Now I'd like to bring in Deborah Pearlstein from the Cardoza Law School. Uh, Deborah, your reaction when you first heard the news tonight? Oh, heartbroken. Uh, she was so many things uh, it, in so many ways, both as a constitutional law scholar, a former lawyer. Her career uh, was uh, unparalleled uh, as an advocate before she came to the bench, her opinions on the bench. And I think in many respects, although it's going to take a long time to unpack her legacy, what she has come to mean to multiple generations of women, and particularly the young women who I teach who are in law school today, many generations her junior, um, who have come to know uh, Justice Ginsburg as an icon and a symbol of uh, women's rights and, and women's equality in a country that hasn't always uh, respected them as they should. And Ginsburg was one of the first women to graduate from Columbia's law school. Kind of give us a sense of the climate uh, at that time for women entering into law. Well, I wasn't entering into law then myself, but she has herself described what the climate was like. There were very few women. She's spoken, and I think you just played uh, one of her speeches in which she described going to Cornell as an undergraduate, um, in which, she, you know, there were, what, four men to every young woman. That was, and as an undergraduate, law school even more so. Uh, and being a woman was an enormous obstacle in her early career, just because she she was a woman, unable to get jobs, even though she was as qualified and often more qualified um, than men who were her contemporaries. And that was how she began her career, not with the women behind her, but fighting every step of the way. And give us a sense, we were just talking with Kate Shaw about this tiny stature she had, but how she loomed yes. so large. What was it about her? I mean, really demure on her face, right? If you just at first appearances, um, but that she was able to, to really strike fear potentially and, and kind of be <laughs> the big presence in the room. She 
really was. I had the great uh, good fortune when I was clerking at the court myself for Justice Stevens. Um, it was a tradition that other clerks, she would invite the clerks of each of the other justices up to her chambers. This was when her husband was still with her, and he was a wonderful cook and a great uh, baker. And he would typically send her in to work, having baked something good for the clerks who were visiting, and she would have us up to chambers to chat over tea. Um, and she was indeed tiny, uh, physically tiny, um, and soft-spoken and slow-spoken. Um, but I admit, I remember uh, holding my breath more in that room than I did in the chambers of <laughs> Justice Kennedy or Justice Scalia or any of the others who were who were quite uh, quite intimidating in their own right. There was something about her quietness um, that. You know, she didn't need to fill the room with words. She really just filled it herself. Deborah Pearlstein, we thank you so much for talking with us tonight. I'd like to bring Devin Dwyer back in, who's also joining us again on the phone from, from D.C. Uh, Devin, talk to us about the relationship uh, between her and Justice Brett Kavanaugh. It was one of the most remarkable things about her, Lindsay. Um, you know, I've been covering the court now for ABC News for a couple of years, and I have been struck by her friendship with arguably the most contentious member of the court, aside from Clarence Thomas, Justice Kavanaugh, of course, the youngest uh, member, the newest member of the court, uh, was embroiled in that firestorm over those uh, sexual assault allegations when he was confirmed. Uh, and Ginsburg was uh, the most outspoken in praising uh, Justice Kavanaugh in public, calling him a great guy, a wonderful, uh, decent individual. And, of course, Kavanaugh returning the compliments in kind, calling her an inspiration. It was sort of uh, the odd couple, if you will, on the court, but they were showing that this that this court can uh, find common ground, that they can be collegial even if they disagree with each other. But when I met with her in chambers last year, Lindsay, it was, I was struck by her pragmatism over those allegations against Kavanaugh. I asked her about them, uh, and she basically, um, you know, passed them off, that people need to focus on the work that the court is doing. Uh, she wanted to be a bridge builder. She wanted to be an advocate for women at the same time. And I'll never forget the last question um, that I asked her before we ended our, our lovely one-hour meeting. I said, um, what do you see as the next frontier in the fight for gender equality in this country. Uh, and she said it's unconscious bias. She said it's something that's really hard to root out. I asked her if there's any unconscious bias on the court today. She actually said no. She thought it, uh, it had been addressed. Um, but she said that's the tip of the spear. That's where uh, the Me Too movement and women's rights advocates need to be focused, unconscious bias in the workplace. And, of course, she had famously talked about how to the brethren that they need to get uh, their feet off of uh, the necks of, of women. Uh, give that's us a right. sense of what we have lost, what we have lost as a, as a society, as a country, with the passing of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. We've heard it over and over again tonight, Lindsay. She was an icon, a public servant, uh, a legal luminary, uh, and someone that, you know, for, for as much as both sides in our, our sharp partisan divide in this country caricature the justices uh, and as, as conservatives or liberals, she rejected the labels. She didn't consider herself a liberal. She said she believed in judicial restraint. Um, as others have talked about tonight, she took a lot of heat for suggesting that Roe v. Wade perhaps uh, should have been decided on different grounds and, and not gone as far when it did at the time, uh, even though no question she's a supporter uh, of, uh, of the right to, to, uh, to abortion. Um, but she was someone who was very measured. She was very reasonable. She was very thoughtful. And I think that's why uh, she won the respect of all of her colleagues uh, on the Supreme Court and by so many around the country, including tonight, as we're seeing, an outpouring from Republicans, Lindsey Graham praising her, Kellyanne Conway, uh, President Trump's former uh, senior advisor advisor uh, writing uh, a, a very flattering uh, commentary about Justice Ginsburg on Twitter tonight, Lindsay. And so she was someone that all of us could find something to love about, uh, both for her service uh, and for her determination. Devin Dwyer, our thanks to you, and we'll be right back. stories of our time, anytime, Nightline. Your mom said, comb your hair. 
dad told you, smarten up. Your dog is judging you right now. And your best friend just called you crazy. We all need someone who'll pull no punches and give it to us straight. Now imagine getting your news like that. No bull, no spin, just give it to me straight. Straightforward news, straight to the heart of the story. ABC News, straightforward. The Americans here on the ground and the Iraqis. 18,000 tons. Ismail? David. David. Over ground zero from Hurricane Michael. You can see just home after home. David, thanks for meeting us. This was your view. My favorite view. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. With so much on the line, ABC News, America's number one news, is right there for you live on Hulu with stories of strength, stories of hope. Because now when it matters most, Hulu has live news. Hulu has live news. Hulu has live news. And that news is ABC News. ABC News Live on Hulu. ABC News Live on Hulu. Watch the news you need. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Streaming to all Hulu subscribers right now. COVID-19, what can you do to help protect yourself? Where can you get your questions answered? The new daily podcast from ABC News with Dr. Jennifer Ashton and a team of experts. Listen free on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. If you are just joining us, we are sad to pass along the news that the Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg has died this evening, surrounded by her family at her home in Washington, D.C., due to complications of metastatic pancreatic cancer. She was 87 years old. We'll have much more on her life in just a moment. But first, Juju Chang has this. Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a force to be reckoned with. All I ask of our brethren, is that they take their feet off our necks. Barely five feet tall, but a liberal giant. Only the second female justice named on the Supreme Court, serving there for more than a quarter century. Her path to the highest court in the land was not easy. As one of the few women at Harvard Law School, she faced discrimination after graduating from Columbia in the 50s. Her tenaciousness in the classroom highlighted in the Oscar-nominated documentary on Ginsburg titled RBG, produced by journalists Julie Cohen and Betsy West. She was one of nine women in a class of 500. She was tied for first in her class. And the big New York City law firms just weren't hiring women. Not a law firm in the entire city of New York bid for my employment. Charging forward, she became a beloved law professor at Rutgers and worked as a lawyer for the ACLU. She mapped out a legal strategy to file lawsuits against gender bias in employment, housing, and government benefits. Men and women are persons of equal dignity and they should count equally before the law. You won't settle for putting Susan B. Anthony on the new dollar. Right? <laughs> <laughs> when they would say things like this. How did you respond? Well, never in anger, as my mother told me. That's, that would have been self-defeating. Always as an opportunity to teach. I did see myself as kind of a kindergarten teacher in those days because the judges didn't think sex discrimination existed. Well, one of the things I tried to plant in their minds was Think about how you would like the world to be for your daughters and granddaughters. She won five landmark cases, which she argued on behalf of women in front of an all-male bench long before she sat on it. Ginsburg went on to serve as an appeals court judge in the nation's capital until that life-changing nomination by President Bill Clinton in 1993. I am proud to nominate for Associate Justice of the Supreme Court Judge Ruth Bader Ginsburg. That announcement may Appeals never have happened had it not been for the intense lobbying effort by a staunch feminist, her husband, Marty Ginsburg. He really felt she was brilliant and, and she deserved it and it would be good for the country. And at her confirmation hearing, chaired by then Senator Joe Biden, the nominee did not shy away from her feminism, spotlighting contentious topics like abortion rights. This is 
something central to a woman's life, to her dignity. It's a decision that she must make. The Senate confirmed her in a sweeping 96 to 3 vote. She began quickly making her mark on historic cases. She's perhaps best known for a decision in 1996 that struck down a male-only admissions policy at the Virginia Military Institute, opening the door for women to study there. It's Justice Ginsburg writing an opinion that builds on the foundations that lawyer Ruth Bader Ginsburg essentially helped to lay. I know that there were some people who did not react well to the change, and my response to this was, Wait and see. You will be proud of the women who become graduates of VMI. And in a landmark case on employment discrimination in 2007, Ginsburg wrote a powerful dissent that prompted Congress to amend the laws. Named for the woman who filed the claim, the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act became one of the first pieces of legislation signed into law by President Barack Obama. Yeah. While on the Supreme Court, Justice Ginsburg was a consistently liberal voice on issues like abortion, voting rights, and the separation of church and state. Off the bench, she was the first Supreme Court justice to perform a same-sex marriage ceremony. Her tenure was not without controversy, breaking tradition for a justice when Ginsburg spoke out against then-candidate Donald Trump, including to the New York Times, calling him a, quote, faker, saying, I can't imagine what the country would be with Donald Trump as our president. Ginsburg later adding that her comments were, quote, ill-advised and that she regretted making them. But throughout it all, Justice Ginsburg won the respect of many conservatives with her grasp of the law and her carefully crafted opinion. And as the court shifted to the right, her scathing dissents elevated her to a pop culture icon, inspiring legions of young fans and feminists to emulate her famous outspokenness. 25, 24, 23. And her fitness routines, earning her the hip-hop-inspired nickname Notorious RBG. Many varieties. Her fame, burnished by her fashion statements, her distinctive collars becoming her calling card. And this is what I use for announcing majority opinion. This one is for dissenting opinion. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg helped focus our country on its most basic values of justice and equality, leaving a legacy of majority opinions and powerful dissents for generations to come. Despite her sharp words against President Trump in the past, we do have a uh, new comment in from Eric Trump, who uh, sent a tweet out saying, Justice Ginsburg was a remarkable woman with an astonishing work ethic. She was a warrior with true conviction, and she has my absolute respect. R.I.P. I'd like to bring in now Betsy West. She is the director of the documentary RBG. Thank you so much, Betsy, for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. It's a sad night. It is a sad night indeed. I'd like to get a sense, if we can back up here, what made you decide uh, to do this documentary about Ruth Bader Ginsburg? You know, in 2015, as Juju just explained, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, began to uh, gain more attention from people as she was issuing dissents. Uh, to opinions that um, she felt uh, were too conservative, that were really uh, going against the, the values of our country. And uh, she was known as the notorious RBG after a uh, book was written about her and uh, a, a Facebook blog. And uh, we realized that many people didn't know the backstory. They knew that here was this feisty, elderly female justice who was really speaking truth to power with her dissent, they didn't know her history. Uh, I mean, the fact is that even had uh, she not become a Supreme Court justice, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg earned a place in history for what she did to win equality for American women as a litigator in the 1970s. And um, we thought that was 
a pretty important and great story to tell, along with her personal story, extraordinary love story to, uh, as Juju said, a feminist husband. And um, we were extremely honored to be able to uh, make the documentary. Uh, of course, um, you had unprecedented access and got to spend a, a tremendous amount of time with the justice. What were some of the nuggets that you found most striking, remarkable, memorable? Well, I think overall her just energy, her determination. I mean, sometimes we were one time we were filming in Chicago, and then um, you know a long day in Chicago at several events, including the the uh, memorial service for Justice Scalia. And then uh, we were going back to Washington, where she was doing a panel before some law students, and then found out that in between she stopped off in Notre Dame to to give a talk. I mean, we could barely keep up with her, and this was on her off season. <laughs> I mean, as a, a jurist, uh, she was known for uh, her prodigious uh, just uh, uh, output, uh, even when she was sick. Uh, I think last year she issued uh, uh, more words than, than any other justice. I mean, this was one hardworking, determined person. She also had, you know, a little intimidating at first, uh, very soft-spoken and um, obviously kind of had an aura around her, but she had a great sense of humor, and um, we came to appreciate that as well. Not to mention the fact that she's a role model to every single older woman, myself included, for her amazing workout routine, which uh, my director— And younger women. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I mean, Julie Cohen and I were able to witness it firsthand. We didn't quite believe it until we got into the gym. And uh, let me tell you, she didn't stop for, uh, you know, well over a half an hour. It was intense. Did you get a sense of what motivated her? I mean, certainly her mother was a major influence in her life. Uh, her husband was a significant advocate. Um, but as far as in that physical way, as far as her work ethic, all of it uh, combined, did you get a sense of, of what it was that propelled her? Yeah, I mean, first of all, she loved her work. I think it was very clear to us just how much she loved the law. And um, I think she saw, as a young woman during uh, the McCarthy era in the 1950s, that lawyers stepped in to really help defend our society uh, and our Constitution. And she believed that um, she believed in the rule of law, and she believed that uh, she had an important role to fill, first as a litigator, and then as a judge, and then as a justice, as someone who was uh, had an expansive view of we the people. Uh, she used to talk about this a lot, that uh, the Constitution has evolved to protect those who were not originally included in the language, women, minorities, non-property owners. And also, she just, uh, you know, she just had a big legal brain. That's why she and Justice Scalia got along so well. They um, were both experts in procedural law, which I don't really understand, but I know that was uh, uh, important to her. And uh, certainly the traditions of the court and of the Supreme Court and of the collegiality that she maintained with all of her colleagues, including those with whom she might have ideological differences. Betsy West, we thank you so much for your work and for your time tonight. I'm now going to pass it over to my colleague, David Muir. Tonight, the breaking news as we come on the air in the West. Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg has died. Surrounded by family in her Washington, D.C. home, Chief Justice John Roberts tonight paying tribute, saying our nation has lost a jurist of historic stature. Our team standing by. World News Tonight begins now. From ABC News World Headquarters in New York, this is World News Tonight with David Muir.